Hey friends, my name is Lauren Jackson, the creator of Kids Ministry Circle. Kids Ministry Circle is a community for kids ministry leaders to be encouraged and equipped to love and serve the local church. Today, we are diving into five steps to launching a kids ministry in a small church or church planting context. Now I know firsthand what it feels like to lead a kids ministry in both a small church and a church plant. My hope is that these five steps that we talk about will give you a place to start, will give you a roadmap to follow, and will give you some really practical tips on what you need to build and launch a kids ministry. Now it's important before we dive into the details to remind you and to remind myself that we need to be praying for this ministry. We need to be praying for the kids and the families and the volunteers and all your people that will be entering into those classrooms. Even with prayer, leading a kids ministry comes with moments of frustration and failure. But also, there are so many moments of joy and celebration. By the grace of God in a kids ministry environment, you get the opportunity to teach kids about Jesus for the very first time. You get to hear as they memorize scripture and hide God's word in their hearts. You get to celebrate as they receive their new Bible and begin to read the stories of the scriptures. And Lord willing, you get to celebrate them when they proclaim Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There is nothing better than watching kids come to know Jesus and watching families and generations be transformed because your volunteers and your staff made the decision to invest in the next generation. Man, I've got chills just thinking about it. And so I want to make sure as we dive into the details that you cover this ministry and your leaders with prayer. That is the ultimate foundation for everything that we do because we know that without the work of God in our lives, we can do nothing. So let's jump in let's start with step number one now as i go through these five steps it's important to visualize a tiered cake right we have this ultimate foundation of step number one and they all build on each other so i would recommend not jumping around but try and do steps one through five in the order that i say them step number one is find a leader and cast a vision so step number one, name a leader and cast a vision. This may seem really obvious when you are launching a ministry or beginning something new. It is important to figure out who's in charge. Who is the go-to person for questions, suggestions, and information? Who is the decision maker? This person does not need to be on staff or even on your payroll, but they can be appointed as the leader. The lead pastor cannot be both preaching in adult service and making sure their volunteers are set up and the kids are participating in their lesson. Lead pastor, you cannot do both. You have to delegate and appoint a leader. This job is often delegated and defaulted to a pastor's wife, and that's great. I've seen so many thriving kids ministries be led by a staff or pastor's wife. Your leader does not need to have all the answers or even have a ton of children's ministry experience. But what they do need to have is a willing heart and a teachable spirit. Once you've named a leader, start casting vision. Do you have a mission and vision statement for your church? Great, use a variation of that. You do not need to recreate the wheel for your kids ministry or create a separate mission and vision. Your kids ministry should be an extension of your adult service, not a different church entirely. Here are some examples that I found of mission statements for kids ministry. The first one is we come alongside parents to raise up the next generation to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Another one is creating a safe space for children to experience the love of God and the truth of the gospel. And the last one is cultivating childhood beliefs into a lifetime of faith. Those are great examples of a mission statement for a kid's ministry. Your word should follow your values. And if you claim to be a church that values the next generation of believers, you need to talk about it. Share stories of what's happening in your kid's ministry. Celebrate volunteers. The experience will continue to shift as your church and community grows, but how you communicate around your kids ministry has to be intentional from the beginning. If you get up on the platform and say, man, we really need volunteers to 
sacrifice their time in adult service and jump back into the classroom, that doesn't invite anybody into the work that God is doing in the lives of your kids. So it's important to think about how you want to communicate to your church the importance and the value of kids in your greater community. So think of the next, we've got the leader and you've got your mission and vision. So the second step is to create a space and make it safe. Once you have a leader in place, it's important to find a safe space for your kids ministry to gather. I emphasize the word safe because safety has to be a foundation in your ministry. If your space and your volunteers are not safe, parents will not leave their kids in your care. As we talk about safety in children's ministry, it's important to remember this phrase, safety plus intentionality equals trust. We'll talk about intentionality in just a second, but let's hit the safety thing first. Here are three questions to ask when you are working towards creating a safe environment for kids. Question number one is who has access? Your kid space should be closed to any non-parents and non-volunteers and really anybody who does not have a claim tag or a corresponding number to whatever the kids have on their name tags. It can be a door that's closed and locked. It can be a divider that has a sign on it that you can't move. It could also be a security volunteer. I know sometimes in the setup and teardown or small church environment, you don't have closed doors. You have a hallway that is open and can't really be secured by a door or a divider. So you invite a volunteer to stand there and be a security volunteer, making sure that any unwanted guests are not allowed access. Question number two, is it child-proofed? Are you using a high school classroom or a conference room that has accessibility to cleaning supplies, open outlets, technology cords? Walk through the space and lock all those cabinets, plug those outlets and tuck away any cords. An easy way to do this, if you have a toddler, you bring your toddler with you and I guarantee you, they will get into all the things that you then need to put away before church on Sunday morning. Question number three is, do you have enough adults? There should always be two adults in every room. I know this can be really hard to accomplish as a small church or church planting church, but this policy will protect your kids, your volunteers, and your church. It is better to close a classroom than to have to have only one volunteer working. It puts everyone at risk. As you continue to grow and onboard volunteers, there are specific trainings and processes that you can participate in to increase safety. And we'll get to that in the next step. Once you have a few safety policies in place, you can work towards intentionality. Your space does not need to be the biggest. It does not have to have the latest technology or the flashiest paint job or all the new fancy toys, but you can tweak it so that it looks like kids belong there. If a kid walks into a stale conference room, they won't get excited. They won't want to come back. They won't feel like they belong. They'll feel out of place. But here are some simple ways to practice intentionality around a kid's ministry space. The first one is finding kid-sized chairs and kid-sized tables. You don't want a preschooler trying to crawl up to an adult sized chair to participate in small group. So maybe you can invest in some bright colored chairs or bright colored tables that add that pop of color and can be really inviting for your small children in your preschool or toddler classrooms. The next one is colorful signage. This is really important because you need that wayfinding signage to help families know where they're going, especially those new families. Do you have a sign that tells families where to check in? Do you have a sign telling families what classrooms are what? And do you have a sign telling families where the bathrooms are? Those are all important. And even in a set up and tear down church, you can find signs like sandwich boards or use command strips or suction things that go on windows. There are so many options to be creative that you can do even in a temporary space. The next thing is a colorful carpet or carpet squares. How fun would it be to walk in and have this really cute multicolored carpet where all the preschoolers gather together for large group? That not only adds color, but it gives kids a place to belong on the carpet with all of their friends. The next thing is fun music playing when kids walk in. No kid wants to walk into a classroom that's 
silent. That's boring, that's not exciting, that's not welcoming. You want to play music, have it be exciting, get the kids ready to go for the morning by inviting them to listen and maybe sing along to some music that you are playing. The last thing is a friendly volunteer to welcome your families. Now this is often can be overlooked, but having a volunteer at your new family check-in or right in front of the classroom doors is important. When you have a volunteer who knows the kids by name and says, hey Lauren, I'm so excited that you're here. Welcome to church. How was your week? What happened? I was praying for you. All of those things. That shows the kids that they matter and that this is their place to belong. So those are just some simple ways to choose intentionality when thinking about your kids' ministry space. One of the best and most stressful problems for a small church or church plant is not having enough space. There's a good chance you've already felt this tension. It may feel tempting to sacrifice safety or intentionality to fit more kids into a classroom or to get more adults into the adult worship space. Unfortunately, this will not serve you in the long run. Invite the big kids to sit with their families for service to make more space in the kids' ministry areas or launch a second service. Choose those things before you sacrifice safety. The third step is build a team and onboard intentionally. We've seen this word intentionally a lot and it's important. When you're building a ministry, you want to do it with intention. You want to Think about the why behind the what. You want to be able to make your vision and mission come to life even in your kids' ministry. So you're gonna keep hearing the word intentionally. Now you get to move into the fun part. It's time to gather your people. You have a leader and you have a safe space. Now you need to find volunteers to lead and teach and play with the kids. Recruiting volunteers can be scary. Maybe you've already experienced what it feels like to recruit volunteers, but is there anything better than inviting people into something super fun and shares the gospel with the next generation of believers? In my opinion, there's nothing more exciting than that. So remember back at the first step, we talked about casting vision. Well, this is where that vision and mission come in handy. Take your vision and mission and create what I like to call an elevator pitch. It doesn't have to be super salesy, but it does need to be inviting and intriguing. You should leave the people wanting to know more and wanting to be involved. Here is an example of an elevator pitch that I often use when recruiting volunteers. Hey, my name is Lauren Jackson and I'm the kids director here on staff. Our church, we have the opportunity to partner with parents and share the story of Jesus with the next generation. We are so excited to be opening up a brand new classroom for our first through third graders. As we work to open up that classroom, we are looking for four great people to lead this classroom on Sunday morning, two to be lead teachers and two to be assistants. They will play games, talk about the story, sing songs, have snack and have so much fun. We would love for you to join our team. Can you spend this week praying about what it would look like for you to serve in our ministry for the next school year? And I'll be in touch next week. A couple things to note about recruiting volunteers and about that elevator pitch that I just gave. I was specific. I told you exactly what role I was looking for. I was looking for two teachers to lead the first through third grade small group and two teachers to be assistants. I named the commitment. I said, I am looking for volunteers to lead during the next school year. And I acknowledge the need. I say, hey, this is what we need to open up this classroom. It's important to not be afraid to name the need. Everyone needs volunteers. Churches can't run without them. You're not the only church that is needing volunteers. So just talk about it, own it, name the need. If you need 10 people to open a classroom, you share that. If you need someone to hold babies or lead worship, talk about it. The biggest hurdle to recruiting volunteers is leaving your people in the unknown. When your people don't know what they are being invited to, they won't say yes. It's just like if you were invited to a party but no one told you what time it starts, where to go, or what to bring, you wouldn't want to go. And the same thing applies to volunteering. It's important to give as many details as you can so volunteers can start picturing themselves serving in your ministry. Once you get a yes from your volunteer, it's time to celebrate, but then it's time to onboard. 
The onboarding process is a big part of answering those what, where, and when questions that we just talked about. The onboarding process gives you the chance to get to know your volunteer and it gives the volunteer a chance to get to know the ministry. Here are four basic steps to the onboarding process and the questions that they answer. So number one is an application. This can be an easy get to know you document that you gather information. This helps you know who they are and what their story is. Are they a member of your church? Are they a believer? Do they agree with your statement of faith? Those are some basic questions that an application should cover. Step number two, background check. This is where you figure out if they have any red or yellow flags. Please, please, please do not skip the background check process. You can talk to your local police station or you can check into organizations called Protect My Ministry or Ministry Safe or Checker to set up the background check process. Step number three, child abuse training. This helps you figure out if they can help you keep your environment safe. This is often a big hurdle and one that's overlooked when it comes to an onboarding process. And I will say that a child abuse training should be included from the beginning. It is highly important and you want to make sure that your parents and your volunteers know that you are doing everything you can to educate and inform your people about the child abuse signs to look for and what to do if you suspect a child abuse situation. And then step number four is a shadow Sunday. So allow this new volunteer to watch what it looks like. And this helps you answer the question of, is it a right fit? Maybe they shadow in the toddler classroom and they come out and they say, hey, toddlers are not for me. Let me try grade school or vice versa. You want them to be able to have the freedom to say, hey, this is not a right fit. Let's try something else. This is a basic onboarding process. And now as you grow and your volunteers grow and your leadership grows, I would encourage you to add an interview process. This is just another way to get to know your volunteers at a deeper level. And oftentimes it helps you see those yellow flags that maybe a background check does not pick up. As you work to build your team, don't forget to have fun. You get the chance to create the culture of your ministry from the beginning, which is so much easier than trying to change culture 10 years in. So celebrate and appreciate your team like crazy. Buy donuts, get the tacos, order the church swag, pray for your team. Celebrate new volunteers and encourage them throughout the week. Create a team culture where your team feels valued and that the work that you're doing is important. Ministry is the long game. And so oftentimes in kids ministry, we don't see the fruit of the works of our labor right away. And so continue to share stories and remind volunteers why they do what they do. It is so fun when you get to do ministry side by side with your friends. All right, step number four is find a curriculum and teach the gospel. So this next step is to figure out what your volunteers are teaching. There's a slight chance that you may have a curriculum in mind, especially if you are a part of a specific denomination or you are a part of a church planting network that uses a specific curriculum. And that's great. But if you don't, here are some things to think about about choosing a curriculum. The first one is theology. Does the theology and statement of faith of the curriculum align with your theology and your statement of faith? Get a sample of the curriculum. Test it out. Is what the curriculum teaching in the big idea, foundational truth, basic truth, whatever they call it, align with what you want your kids to be learning? That's an important thing. The second thing is budget. How much money do you have set aside for your kids' ministry curriculum? Now you can spend $200 a year on curriculum, or you can spend $3,000 a year on curriculum. It's totally up to you. Both are great options, but it definitely it's your choice on what your budget is. The third thing is prep time. How much time do you want to spend prepping the curriculum and do you have space to store supplies? Curriculums will vary in the time that it takes to prepare for the Sunday morning and most curriculums will vary in the supplies that you need to have on hand. So pay attention to what the curriculum says. You can ask questions before you buy. And then the last thing, the fourth thing is technology. Do you have the right technology in place? Are you going to be showing videos? Do you need to install a TV? Do you have a printer? All of these things are important to ask when it comes to technology and curriculum. Here are some of my favorite top curriculums to look into. 
Gospel Project, Grow, Orange, Wonder Inc, Go Curriculum, and Bright. As you are on the hunt for curriculum, don't forget that Kids Ministry Circle has a YouTube video walking you through some of the major curriculums on the market. So don't forget to watch this video as you are deciding what curriculum to use. And don't forget that almost all curriculums will give you an entire month for free. So download the sample, check it out, give it to parents, get some feedback, and that will definitely help you figure out what curriculum is the best fit for your community. This is the last step, but it's also an extremely important step. We all know that kids ministry leaders only see kids one to two hours a week, and that's if they're coming to church every single weekend. Parents get significantly more hours with their kids. In addition to the time that they get with their kids, we see how important it is for the parents to disciple their kids all throughout the Bible. A large part of your job should be investing in parents and teaching them how to lead at home. It is said that your home should be seen as a mission field and that parents are first in line to teach their kids the gospel. What a humbling job parents have but what a great opportunity you have to be the parents and grandparents' biggest cheerleader. Here are three things to think about when it comes to partnering with parents. First is don't assume they know where to start. Maybe they didn't grow up in church. Maybe they were not discipled as children, or maybe they don't feel confident enough in their own knowledge of who God is to have conversations with their kids at home. The second thing is think seasonal rhythms, not daily commitments. Seasonal changes come and with every seasonal change comes an opportunity for new rhythms. When you present parents with an everyday commitment, you are setting them up for failure. They're going to miss a day and they're going to feel like they can't continue. And that will cause feelings of shame and being unqualified. But what's really helpful when you partner with parents is giving them seasonal tasks. Think about the big seasons, Advent, Lent, summertime, fall, Promote more consistent devotionals around these seasons and encourage parents to weave Jesus into everyday conversation all throughout the year. What I'd like to do is I like to send parents seasonal resources. So pulling together a bunch of Advent devotionals or pulling together a bunch of board books to read at home during the Easter season or finding fun activities for them to do throughout the summertime that they have in the evenings or while they're traveling or more time throughout those months. The third thing is keep it simple and keep it consistent. There are a lot of voices in the world and you want the church's voice to be the most encouraging when it comes to reminding parents of their responsibility and opportunity to parent their kids in a countercultural way. Keep the message simple and keep it consistent. Keep sending emails, keep sending text messages and keep sharing resources. When you continue to show up in the good times, parents will know where to turn in the hard times. Those are our five steps. You made it to the end. Take a deep breath. It may seem like a lot, but start with step one. Begin building this ministry one step at a time. Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to rely on Jesus and don't forget to invite others into the process. If you get stuck, if you have questions, reach out. The team at Kids Ministry Circle is here to support you and cheer you on in this process. You can find us over on Instagram and Facebook at Kids Ministry Circle, or you can head over to kidsministrycircle.com where we've got a handful of other free resources for you to reference and use in your ministry as you grow and learn as a leader. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video so that you can get more videos like this sent right to your inbox when they launch. All right, friends. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.